I'm Morton Halperin. I'm Senior Advisor of the Open Society Foundations. Well, I think it marked an acceptance by both sides that they did not need nuclear weapons to meet their security needs. And that opened the possibility of more extensive reductions, but also to moving towards a world in which if nuclear weapons had not disappeared, they were no longer considered actually instruments of policy. I think the most important from my point of view, the most important thing is that no nuclear weapon has been used in war since Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And that's an extraordinary fact. And I think a number of things account for it. One, of course, is the destructive power of nuclear weapons. But I think one thing that contributed to that was the whole set of arms control agreements, which go back to the late 60s, but which were accelerated, accelerated after Reykjavik, and of course accelerated even further when the Soviet Union collapsed. But we've got a long way to go. There's still a lot to do. I am confident that there is no such thing and that it is a meaningless concept and one that draws attention away from the real issues, which is reducing to very low numbers, getting a comprehensive test ban to be truly global, getting a production cut off, and moving further in the direction of everybody understanding that these weapons, that they're not really weapons, that they cannot be used for any rational purpose, and that they will not be used. I think we can end up in a world in which people have these things, but nobody thinks about using them, nobody thinks they're relevant, but nobody's worried about the other side cheating, nobody's tempted to go make a few because everybody understands that each side has a few hundred of these weapons put away to deter anybody from being tempted to want to become the only nuclear power. The thing to understand is that the goal is to prevent the use of nuclear weapons uh, and that the question is what's the best way to prevent the use of nuclear weapons and I believe that's making it clear to countries that nobody could win a race to become the first new nuclear power because there are two or three countries or maybe just two countries that have 200 nuclear weapons, have them locked away so that they can't be used but could take them out in a matter of days or weeks so that if anybody tried to break out, they would be confronted with another nuclear power. I think that's much easier to negotiate. It deals with all the concerns about somebody on the other side cheating, which there's really no answer to. Uh, if the Russians say they have zero and we say they have zero, we have zero, there is no way for anybody to tell whether that's really true, and even to what zero means, because we will still have fissional material, uh, and we will still have delivery systems, and we will still have blueprints to make warheads. So I don't even know what zero is, but even if you could define something and said we'll call that zero, it would be impossible to have anything like 100% confidence that the other side had not cheated and actually had two nuclear weapons or three nuclear weapons, which would become important if nobody else had any. My view is you negotiate down to 200 U.S. and Russian. You may have to have the Chinese accept, have some as well. But the weapons are separated from the delivery systems. The weapons and the delivery systems are both in stored facilities and there are inspectors there at all times and cameras there at all times. So if you break the glass and start moving towards merging the weapons with the delivery systems, the whole world knows about it. Uh, and it's done, they're separated in a way that it takes you weeks, maybe months to put the thing together. And so nobody would have any incentive to do it because if we started doing it, the Russians would do it, the Chinese would do it, and nobody would get anywhere. And at the same time, you have a no first use agreement, you have a prohibition on testing, you have a prohibition on the production of fissional material, all of which is perfectly verifiable, and you have a common growing perception of what has actually been true for the last 60 years, 
which is everybody understands that there's no useful way to use these things, that they're not really weapons, that they can't be used on the battlefield to influence an outcome, and that the, the opprobrium that anybody would have from using them is so much greater than winning a particular battle that nobody's ever come close to using them. You know, in 1950, Truman thought about using them in the Korean War, and at least Prime Minister of England flew over to the United States and basically said, Britain will withdraw from the Korean War, will withdraw from the alliance if you do this. You can't do it. And Truman understood. And that was really the one. People flirted with it in some other occasions, particularly in the U.S. government. But it, nobody was really ever serious about it. And people have understood, and the understanding has grown, that these are not weapons, that you can't use them, that there's no purpose for them. Well, that's what we want to make more formal and more real, and it is real. And my view is that that makes the world much safer than talking about endlessly about how we would get to zero and, and how you would deal with everybody's worry that somebody else is hiding three weapons. I don't think there is any answer to that. I don't think it'll ever happen. But I think we could get to 200 weapons in Russia and the United States and 50 weapons in, in China, and that the world, we would then accomplish everything that people think they would accomplish with zero, which zero will not accomplish because it'll just make everybody nervous about whether somebody else is starting to build a nuclear weapon. I think the place to start is with the test ban. I believe if the United States ratifies the test ban, that China will ratify it. I think that's clear. Uh, and that then we can work together to persuade India and Pakistan uh, to ratify the test ban. And I think that's doable. Uh, and then we need to persuade Israel and Iran to ratify the test ban. And I think that is doable. And then we're left with North Korea. And I think uh, they can, in the end, be persuaded as well, or they can f we can find a way to declare the treaty in force without them. Um, and I think that's the beginning of the process. Then the next step is a cutoff in fissional material, uh, which again, I think, is doable. And if you have those two treaties in place, then you have a ceiling on the Indians and the Pakistanis and the Israelis. And then you try to get them to declare the size of their stockpile and to talk about their willingness to reduce it in the context of further Russian and American in reductions and reductions by Britain, France, and, uh, and China. And then you have a structure in which you're having a conversation among the countries with nuclear weapons about how low well they're prepared to go and what they need from other countries to do it. I think all of that is doable and doesn't require fundamental changes in the nature of international politics. It just requires a serious focus and an understanding that these weapons are really not usable by, by anybody. Um, so I think that's a big task. It's not easy. It's certainly not certain. Um, but it's something that we really do know how to do and could do. Well, I think one does have to be worried about that. And so getting control of the nuclear weapons, getting them reduced to very low numbers, getting those numbers put away in a safe place, and ultimately trying to persuade unstable states that have nuclear weapons that it's really not a good idea, as we were able to do with the successor states of the Soviet Union, all but Russia, that inherited nuclear weapons, gave them up. So I think the South Africans gave them up. Uh, the Libyans gave them up. So I think we should continue to try to persuade countries to give them up. We should continue to work to prevent new countries from getting them. And we should continue to work to make sure that the weapons that do exist are well protected. Uh, because it puts a stop in the case of India and Pakistan and North Korea on the possibility of further development of nuclear weapons. But it's also symbolic. I mean, many years ago, Henry Kissinger had an article in Foreign Affairs against the test ban. And he said he was against the test ban for exactly the same reason that the proponents of it were for the test ban. That is, a test ban 
is a symbol of the fact that these are not weapons, that they can't be used in combat, and that there's no need to further refine or develop them and no purpose to doing so. Uh, and I think that's correct, but it's an understanding that people come to very slowly, if at all, and the test ban symbolizes that, but also institutionalizes that. These are different from other things that are really weapons and can be used on a battlefield. Uh, these are just explosive devices that indiscriminately kill people. They're terrorist weapons. They cannot be used. They should not be used. And the test ban, I think, symbolizes the fact uh, that they will not be used. Well, we have moved forward in some ways. I mean, I think we now have a test ban treaty for a long time. That was a hope and a prayer, and we don't, didn't have a treaty. Uh, we have now, I think, greater consensus around the NPT. We've had a successful outcome of the N last NPT review conference. Uh, we have an agenda, I think, that's broadly agreed that includes ratifying the test ban, moving to the production cutoff. Um, I think my own view is, is that this zero nuclear weapons has been a diversion that's taken away energy away from what really needs to be done. Uh, but a lot of the problem is in the United States and in the disagreement within the United States over no first use, ballistic missile defense, and the test ban treaty. And there is a very strong group now almost entirely in the Republican Party, although not completely, uh, which is committed to not restricting ballistic missile defense, at least by treaty, which is committed to not doing the test ban treaty, uh, and which is strongly opposed to no first use. Now, of course, the irony is in the eight years of the Bush presidency, uh, we did not test, we did not deploy ballistic missile defense. And I think if you had an eight-year Romney presidency, we would not test, and we would not deploy ballistic missile defense. But still, people do not want to agree to it by treaty, and we need 67 votes in the Senate of the United States, and that's very difficult to get. So I think we need to keep working on that problem. And obviously, there are problems in other countries as well. I don't mean to suggest that it's just in the United States.